Welcome back. This is our second video for our course in the history of mathematics. We are continuing our discussion of Egyptian mathematics and moving on to the process described in the Alms Papyrus for division. So let's look at a quick little example here. Uh, we are going to take uh, 61 and divide that by 8. Okay, so this process also involves making a little table with two columns. Now, the order here matters. Of course, multiplication is commutative. You could switch things around, but division is not. So you've got to use the dividend in the right-hand column. Okay, so we're going to start, as with multiplication, we're going to start with a 1 in the left-hand column, and we have to put the divisor, this 8, that's what has to be in the right-hand column. As before, we proceed with some doublings, so double the 1, we get a 2, double the 8 for a 16, then we get a 4, and a 32. Now, at this point, I would stop because these entries in the right-hand column would exceed my dividend of 61. Okay, so... There is a slight difference between what we were doing with the multiplication, where we were looking at the left-hand column, and the division, where we're focusing on the right-hand column. So with the division process, we stop when the right-hand column would exceed whatever this number is, in this case, 61. And now what we're going to do is we are going to look for entries in the right-hand column. looking for entries on the right that get as close as possible to 61 without going over. Okay, so once again, note the difference between what we're doing when we have a division problem versus what we're doing when we have a multiplication problem. When we were doing a multiplication problem, we were looking for entries in the left-hand column. Here, we're looking for entries in the right-hand column. Also, with multiplication, we wanted to get the exact result from adding up the entries in the left-hand column. Here, with a division problem, we are not guaranteed that that's going to happen. We're just going to try to get as close as possible. So in this particular case, it looks like I have to add up all of them to get as close as possible to 61. So if I take 32 plus 16 plus 8, it looks like that gives me 56. Okay. Now, this is not quite coming out even, and we shouldn't expect a division of 2 whole numbers to come out even. Most of the time there'll be some left over, some, some remainder to deal with. So in this case we have, looks like a remainder of 5. Okay, so one way to think about this in our modern notation is that this quotient, 61 over 8, is equal to 7. Okay, now I'm getting the 7 from adding up the corresponding entries in the left-hand column. So adding up the corresponding entries on the left. Okay, so 
to get as close as possible to 61, I had to add up all three of these, which means I'll have to add up to all three of these. So that gets me the quotient. And there is five left over. Okay. So, oops, let me scoop that up so you can see what I just wrote there on the bottom. Okay, so 61 divided by 8 is 7 and 5 eighths. In modern notation, we wouldn't even write the plus sign. Now, this is not how Alms would have written his answer. This fraction, 5 eighths, is not something the Egyptians would have dealt with. So, one peculiar feature of Egyptian arithmetic that we will make a note of here is that the Egyptians expressed all fractions as sums of unit fractions. So in other words, they didn't want to have anything other than a 1 in the numerator of their fraction. So with the Egyptian system, this 5 isn't allowed. Okay, now in this particular case, getting the answer is not too hard. We can break up the 7. Well, we leave the 7, of course, we don't break that up. We can break up the 5 eighths. 5 eighths, of course, is bigger than a half, so it's going to be a half plus something. Okay, now, of course, a half, we could treat that as 4 eighths. So to get to 5 eighths, we just need an additional 1 eighth. So in this particular case, the fraction basically breaks up itself. And this is the way the Egyptians would have written their answer. The whole number part and then any fractional part expressed as a sum of unit fractions. So the question becomes, if you do get a fraction, what is the process of breaking it up into a sum of unit fractions? Now, in the Alms Papyrus, the author doesn't actually discuss any general method for breaking these up. He gives the results of breaking up several fractions when the denominator is odd and the numerator is 2. But he doesn't actually explicitly tell us what his process is. Now, we're going to go over something that can be helpful here. It's called the splitting algorithm. And what the splitting algorithm does is it helps us break up a fraction into the sum of two unit fractions. Okay, and the splitting algorithm goes as follows. So this fraction 1 over n can be split into these two unit fractions. So 1 over n is equal to the sum of 1 over n plus 1 plus 1 over n times n plus 1. So you can verify this pretty quickly by taking the two fractions on the right-hand side, getting a common denominator. If you start on the right-hand side and you want to get a common denominator, you would need an n on the top and the bottom here. Then once you've got the fractions in terms of a common denominator, you would combine the numerators. So we would have n plus 1 over n times n plus 1. And then the factors of n plus 1 cancel out, leaving us with 1 over n. 
So let me show you an example where that could be useful because it seems like we're taking a unit fraction and writing it as a sum of two other unit fractions. So let me go ahead and give you an example of where we might use that. So let's do this example. We're going to take, oh gosh, we're going to take 342 and we're going to divide that by 17. Okay, so we'll follow the same exact procedure that we did before. Start with a 1 here and in the right hand column we've got to have our divisor. Keep on doubling. So Next row would be a 2 and a 34. 4, 68, 8, 136, 16, and 272. Okay. Now, I think I can stop here because my right-hand column would be greater than 342 if I were to do another doubling. So let me just kind of check my math here. 17 times 2 gives you 34, gives you 68, gives you 136, and that does give you... 272. Okay, now we want to get as close as possible to 342 without going over. So we're looking for entries in the right hand column that will have a total that is closest to 342 without going over. And I think what we need to do is take this entry and this entry. So 272 plus 68, and it looks like that is giving us 340, okay, and that's as close as possible to 342 as we can get without going over. So we would add up the corresponding entries in the left-hand column to get the quotient. So that's telling us that 342 over 17 is equal to 16 plus 4, so that gives us 20, so the quotient is 20, and the fractional part is 2 over 17. Okay, so once again we've got a fraction with a 2 in the numerator this time. Now remember the Egyptians want unit fractions. So we're going to have to break this up. Now you might say, okay, well that's easy to do. We can break that up into the sum of unit fractions like this. 2 17th is just 1 17th plus 1 17th. Now, the other, the other uh, peculiarity about the way Egyptians would write fractions is that repeats are not allowed. So you can't say 1 17th plus 1 17th in the Egyptian system. So this is why having that splitting algorithm is nice. We can split up this second 1 17th using the splitting algorithm. So we can keep this 1 17th. And if you look back at that splitting algorithm, it was 1 over n plus 1 plus now, okay, so in this case, n is 17, so 1 over n plus 1 would be 1 over 18. And then we'd have n times n plus 1, so 17 times 18. So if we do the arithmetic there, and we go and do 17 times 18, Uh, let me think here. Uh, 17 times 20 would be 3 
40. And then we should do some subtraction there. Okay, so we should do 340 minus 34 to get 306. So 1 over 306. And this is the way the Egyptians would have expressed the answer to this problem. And you can do that no matter what your numerator is up here. So if you have a 3 up here, you can write 3 copies. Keep this one, break this one up, and break the second one up. Now, for that second one, you'd have to break each of those up again. So it's a recursive process that gets longer and longer, but at least we have some way of doing it. Okay, so that's the Egyptian method of multiplication influencing the Egyptian method of division. Okay, so I want you to work out several examples till you get the hang of using both setups. So the exercises that I'm going to give you will involve you working out some divisions and multiplications using the Egyptian method.